Oh, <laughs> hello. I didn't see you there. Um, welcome to my review of Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode 2. Um, this video is a bit of a follow-up of sorts to my Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode 1 review, so if you haven't seen that one already, I'd highly recommend going and giving it a watch, because I'll be drawing a few comparisons between the two games in this video. So, with that out of the way, uh, let's get into it. I'm going to start right out with what's probably the most important part, the physics. When I let go of the joystick at the peak of my jump, Sonic conserves a bit of momentum on his way down, unlike in Episode 1 where he just plummets straight to the ground. So evidently, the physics have been tweaked a bit, but aside from this minor change, everything seems pretty much the same. Rolling into a ball is still fairly useless, but it feels overall like I'm retaining a bit more momentum in this game. Maybe? I can't really tell. I mean, the Sonic CD remake by Taxman and Stealth was being worked on at the same time as this, right? Why not ask those guys if you could borrow their physics engine? I mean, sure, you probably couldn't just copy and paste it, but surely it could be adapted somehow? Some of the algorithms and calculations could be used? Why try to rebuild Sonic's physics from the ground up when another team you have connections with has already done it and actually done a pretty damn good job of it? Immediately, the graphics are a major step up from Episode 1. The game has an inoffensive yet aesthetically pleasing art style that seems to be informed by Sonic Colors and Sonic Generations. At times, Sonic 4 Episode 2 manages to look pretty damn good, in spite of not being as graphically impressive as other Sonic games at the time. I definitely prefer Episode 2's soundtrack to Episode 1's, though it still has some issues. Even though the songs are a lot more dynamic and better composed, they've still insisted on using the faux retro synthesized beeping sounds, which, while a lot more tolerable than in Episode 1, still make the music difficult to listen to after a while. A more authentic replication of the Genesis sound chip, or even a more modern approach with realistic instruments like the Sonic Heroes soundtrack would have both been much better options to go with. Instead, they've insisted on making the same mistakes as in Episode 1 and turned what could have been a really passable soundtrack into an ear sore. The big change in this game from Episode 1, which a lot of attention was drawn to in the marketing, is the addition of Tails as Sonic's in-game companion, in a pretty unsubtle reference to Sonic 2. There's a twist this time around, though. Sonic and Tails have a handful of combo moves that they can only pull off by working together. When you press the combo move button, gameplay will freeze for a moment as Tails is summoned to you before the move activates. There are three of these combo moves, and the one that triggers is based on your location. If you're in the air, Tails will grab a hold of Sonic and allow you to fly for a short time, much like in Sonic 3. If you're underwater, you'll be able to swim around. This is slightly different to flying, as you have to hold the directional button in the direction you want to go. Tails also won't get tired of swimming, so you can do this as long as you need to. If you're just standing on the ground, you'll do a sort of super-powered spin dash with the ability to clear certain obstacles you can't pass otherwise. While I don't have anything against these new moves being added, I'm not a massive fan of how they were implemented. First off, why the need for the big fanfare every time I activate these? Time freezes, Tails flies towards you, there's a flash of light and an obnoxious sound effect plays. In my opinion, this is all completely unnecessary and makes a ton of fuss about nothing, and when you're using these moves a lot, it gets pretty annoying. Just activate the move, damn it! There's no need to break up the gameplay for no reason at all. Every time you're expected to use one of these moves to advance, there's a big-ass flying screen there to let you know. Like, if I come up to a high wall I can't pass, I'm going to try flying over it. If I come to an obstacle that looks like I can break through it, I'll use my spin dash. This isn't a game for toddlers, so for the love of god, there's no need to treat me like one. This isn't just early on in the game to help you get used to your new moves. No, these screens appear every time you need to use a combo move, all the way through to the game's final level. Not only are these condescending and unnecessary, they're also really out of place. I mean, I get that it's a bit weird for me to say that when we're talking about a game where you break computer monitors to get power-ups, but still, these just feel like they don't belong there. I mean, if you really wanted to, you could achieve the same effect with a sign with an up arrow on it or something, which would at least not look so ridiculously awkward. I was also annoyed that you can't actually activate these moves until you get to the point in the game where you're first supposed to use them. The game ham-fistedly gives you an unlock screen for each move after you beat the first act that lets you activate it. Having to unlock these moves wouldn't have been so bad if there'd been an in-game item or something to collect, but honestly, you unlock all these in the first few acts of the game, so there's no reason to block you from using them anyway. The big problem with the Tails combo moves is that the game only seems to want you to use them in the very specific spots you're supposed to use them. I mean, the flying is useful for recovering from a fall or reaching a higher path, sure, but the spin dash? 
If you use it when you're meant to, to break through obstacles or burrow through snow or whatever, yeah, it works fine, but at pretty much any other point it's more likely to screw you over than do you any good. Like look, I'm being chased by a deadly avalanche. If I use my combo spin dash, I can get some extra speed and outrun it, right? Nah. Like, I really like the idea of being able to use Tails' flight whenever you want, without using a second controller. I think it's a great addition to the classic Sonic formula. If this ability was more organically integrated with the rest of the gameplay and ditched all the unnecessary fanfare with the time freezing and sound effects, then it would have been a solid feature. The combo spin dash, on the other hand, I can't really give credit for anything more than being a gimmick. It feels like it's only necessary because of how weak the regular spin dash is in Sonic 4. In addition to the manually triggered combo moves, there's also these item monitors that trigger a quick time event that lets you kill all the enemies on the screen. I really don't know what to say about this aside from that it's a boring gimmick and doesn't really add anything to the game. Unlike in Sonic 2, there's no option to play as Sonic or Tails solo, which I guess is understandable given how you need the combo moves to clear a lot of the levels. Still, it would have been cool to have the option to play as Tails with Sonic following you. Like Episode 1, Sonic 4 Episode 2 has four main zones, as well as a shorter final zone that's unlocked after beating all the others. Unlike in episode 1, you can't just play these in any order. Actually, the way the different acts are unlocked is kind of jacked up and confusing. At first, it seems like the game's going to be linear like the original classic Sonic games. You start off with only the game's first zone, Sylvania Castle, and you have to play each of the three acts in order. But for some reason, after this, you unlock all three acts of the next two zones, White Park and Oil Desert, all at once. The fourth main zone, Sky Fortress, doesn't open up until you've beaten both of these zones, and like those zones, you can play through Sky Fortress's acts in any order. This isn't necessarily bad or wrong, but I personally found it to be needlessly complicated and really don't see why it couldn't have just been linear. As for the zones themselves, I feel like Episode 2 does a much better job than Episode 1 at making its levels distinctive and interesting. While Sylvania Castle and Sky Fortress are pretty clearly based on Aquatic Ruin and Wing Fortress from Sonic 2, they're aesthetically pleasing enough that they feel like loving tributes to those zones rather than soulless knockoffs. I'm not going to go too in-depth into each of the zones individually, but what I will say is that Sonic 4 Episode 2's level design is a step up from Episode 1's, though nothing groundbreaking. While in true Sonic 4 fashion the game has its share of bullshit moments, overall I enjoyed this game a lot more than Episode 1. Believe it or not, at times I even felt like I was playing a proper classic Sonic game again. Well, almost. The game's bosses are kind of a mixed bag. One of the game's defining moments, or at least what I think is meant to be one of its defining moments, is at the end of Sylvania Castle Zone when two pillars rise up in the fashion of Aquatic Ruins boss fight. Yawn. More recycled boss battles. But wait! Out of nowhere, this crazy giant flower robot bursts out of nowhere and knocks the pillars over. Holy shit! It's a brand new, awesome boss fight! This would have been a cool twist if, you know, the boss didn't actually suck. Eggman just hangs out at the top here, smacking around with his tentacles, and you just use your flight combo power to fly up and hit him. Rinse and repeat. Eight times. After the seventh hit, he has a little power-up sequence and fires a big laser, but who cares? I've already hit him an eighth time and finished the fight. The fight against Metal Sonic in White Park was decent enough, though the springs bouncing you back and forth between the two tracks didn't really add anything and were mostly just annoying. The Oil Desert boss was okay. In the first phase, you have to dodge boxes falling from the ceiling until you eventually get high enough to hit Eggman. An interesting concept, but it drags on for a lot longer than it needs to. In the next phase, he just jumps around, and you have to hit his feet with your combo spin dash when he lands on the platform. This is complete bullshit though, because he stays put for barely two seconds before he jumps off again. By the time you're done charging the spin attack, he's already gone. By some miracle, I was eventually able to hit him just in the nick of time and won the fight. For Sky Fortress, you fight Metal Sonic in an aircraft, which is a cool idea, but which is actually kind of... Well, you get the idea. The final zone, Death Egg Mark II, has three bosses to beat. I don't have time to go over them in detail, but basically the first one's just annoying and bad, and the second one is a race where you literally just use your combo spin dash a couple times to win instantly. In the final boss, you just have to navigate three rings and avoid electricity to get to Eggman in the center and hit him. Once you do that, you just get sent back to the outer ring and repeat the process. Every couple hits, he does... this. 
Which is a pretty cool little animation sequence, sure, but does it actually do or change anything? Well, no. No, it doesn't. For the last couple hits, he has an energy shield around him, which you just break by using your gimmicky-ass combo spin dash. The regular spin dash could break all sorts of shit in Sonic 2 and 3, that was kind of one of its main functions. The other one being going fast, which it's also pretty useless for in Sonic 4. I've said it before and I'll say it again. You could take the combo spin dash out of the game entirely. The only reason it's necessary in the context of the game is because the regular spin dash is nerfed to shit. The only instance I can think of where a non-shitty regular spin dash couldn't replace the combo dash is in the snow burrowing sections in White Park, but that could easily be replaced with some level specific gimmick like a big drill or something. Anyway, after beating the final boss, Sonic and Tails hop into escape capsules to escape the death egg, presumably leaving Eggman to die in a fiery explosion. Well, can't say you didn't have it coming. After the credits are finished rolling, we get the usual reminder to collect all those damn Chaos Emeralds. So yeah, let's talk for a bit about the special stages now. Like Episode 1's special stages are inspired by Sonic 1's, Episode 2's are pretty clearly based on Sonic 2's. The basic premise is the same. You try to collect a certain number of rings before you reach the gates, avoiding obstacles along the way. If you reach a gate without the necessary number of rings, you get kicked out of the stage. There are a few other gimmicks to keep things interesting, but overall, we're dealing with an adaptation of Sonic 2's special stages. Minus Tails constantly getting hit by obstacles and losing all your rings, thankfully. I only managed to get three emeralds in this game, which is better than the one emerald I managed in Episode 1. I get that collecting all seven emeralds is meant to be a challenge, but in these games it just seems a bit beyond me. Apparently, you don't even get a different ending for collecting the emeralds in this game, just the ability to turn into supersonic. So again, I think I'm gonna pass on 100%ing this one. Like Episode 1, Episode 2 has online leaderboards with split rankings for score attack and time attack modes. Like I've said in the Episode 1 review, I really don't see the need for having two modes that are exactly the same just to determine which leaderboard you're competing for. New to this game is an online cooperative mode where you can partner up with a friend or stranger online to play through the game's levels together. I'd love to go into more detail about this, but... I really can't. No, really, I couldn't find a single person to play with. I mean, it's not like there's a bustling online community for this game, especially not five years after its release. Sonic 4 Episode 2 also contains a bonus for people who own a copy of Episode 1 as well. Owning both games unlocks Episode Metal, which is four acts where you play as Metal Sonic, telling the story of how he got from where he was in Sonic CD to your fights against him in Sonic 4. Sadly, these four acts are just modified versions of levels from Episode 1, and after spending time with the much nicer graphics and music of Episode 2, it hits pretty hard what a step backwards this is, and this whiplash completely eclipsed any novelty to be had from playing as Metal Sonic. He doesn't have any new moves or abilities either, the only difference in gameplay is that there's no tails, so no combo moves. Episode Metal? More like Episode Scrap Metal. So, that's Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode 2. Regardless of what you think of it, I think it's a pretty clear step up from its predecessor, even if it didn't manage to amaze and impress many people. So, even though my feelings are mixed, I still think this game is a pretty big step up from the first episode, and a pretty passable platformer overall, so I'm gonna go ahead and give it 3 stars three stars. In other news, Sonic Mania is coming out on PC soon, and it looks really good, and I'm really looking forward to giving that a play. Unfortunately, you're probably not going to get to see my thoughts on that game for a while now, because I'm just, I've been in a big rush to get this video for Sonic 4 Episode 2 done before I go away for this big family trip up to Queensland, so... Yeah, um, you're just going to have to hold out for that, but if you want to catch it when it comes out, make sure you're subscribed. Oh, uh-oh. Looks like I've got a plane to catch. I'll see all you beautiful people again real soon.